My name is Zola and I am the daughter of two Holocaust survivors, Zavia Pietka and Chayala Rosenthal. 80 years ago today, in the town of Vilna, my father, 21-year-old Israel Uten, already a respected journalist for local newspapers, wrote an article about a local teenager, Chayala Rosenthal, my mother, who had just won a national singing competition and had been invited to perform in Moscow at the upcoming International Song Festival. My mother was so excited to go to Russia, but sadly, it was not meant to be. For days later, her beautiful voice playing on the radio was suddenly drowned out by the deafening sound of explosions and the deep rumbling drone of German low-flying Stuka airplanes that filled the sky, dropping bombs onto their beloved Vilna. Within days, life for the Jews in Vilna changed for the worse. Jews were dismissed from employment and soldiers began rounding up Jewish males and sending them off to work for Germans wherever they saw fit. Not all returned home. Lithuanians searched Jewish homes for weapons and stole items of value. Jews were being targeted and publicly humiliated daily. One afternoon, my grandfather, a well-known doctor and councilman, was grabbed by locals as he was walking in the streets. They pointed guns at him, ordering him to get down on his knees and clean the street with his bare hands, while they stood laughing, cursing at him and kicking him, as they did to so many others. My father recalled how one day when he was standing in line for a bread ration, the locals pushed him to the back to the end of the line, again and again, till he was forced to walk back home, empty-handed. Overnight, the respect and dignity of the Jews were ripped away in every single moment of every single day at each corner of every street. There was always a threat of personal attack, humiliation, and ugly violence. 80 years ago, on July 4th, Einsatz Commando No. 9 rolled into the city. Deployed from the unit of Einsatz Group in B, these armed and uniformed SS men, together with their Lithuanian collaborators, forced Jews out of their homes or kidnapped them off the streets under the pretext that they were being taken away to work outside of the city. Instead, those Jews were marched to the Lukiski prison yard, where they were held outdoors for several days and then taken to the Ponari forest, where they were brutally murdered mercilessly shot, their bodies falling into pits and ravines buried in anti-tank ditches, quarries and gorges. My mother's father, Nochum Rosenthal, who was the owner and the editor of Der Ovent Kuria, Vilna's most popular Yiddish daily newspaper, was among the first to be taken and shot. At first, the killings were aimed at those who were easily accessible. The Jewish males, particularly those in leadership positions and members of the intelligentsia, their families were then forced to pay ransom to try and get them back home, but none returned. The killings soon escalated to include all Jewish men, women, and children. Einsatz Commando 9 carried out these actions day after day until they left the city at the end of July. Relief was short because just days later, Einsatzkommando 3, a unit of Einsatzgruppen A, entered Vilna and those horrific mass murders were continued. One action after another. On the 1st of September, my mother's grandparents, neighbors and her best friend were taken away along with 5,000 more Vilna Jews each having been told to pack and bring soap and a change of clothing, they were going to work, but all were taken away to be killed. A week later, on the 6th of September, the Germans set up two ghettos for the remaining Vilna Jews. Ghetto number one housed those who could work, who could be a useful labor force, 
while the smaller ghetto number two imprisoned the unproductive, the weak, the sickly and elderly Jews, soon to be systematically gotten rid of over time. That same day on the 6th of September, Lithuanian police and SS men ordered my father and his family to leave their home and belongings, forcing them into ghetto number one. They moved into a small room to be shared with eight others. Food was scarce and a public kitchen was established where people could get a few rations, some soup, some weak tea. Usually the first meal was at midday. Some of those who worked outside the ghetto were given soup and a piece of bread by their employers. Soon some brave and bold workers arranged for supplies to be snuck in and out of the sewers in secret places, bringing more food and other products necessary for survival into the ghetto. The underground resistance risked their lives listening to smuggled in radios in the hopes of learning more about the war's progress, but mostly Jews had very little knowledge of the Nazis' plans. Living in constant fear, never knowing when the next action or attack would be, they just knew it would come at any time. At all times, the Jews were forced to wear the identifying yellow Star of David on their clothing. They were forbidden to walk on pavements. They had to walk in the middle of the street on those uneven cobbled stones that were hard on the frail and the elderly. In those first few weeks of ghetto life, Jews continued to be murdered by the Einsatzkommando units every single day. It seemed like many of those with work permits called the Shane were mostly spared the consequences of the actions. My father and his father were fortunately each issued with a yellow shame and were assigned different work projects outside of the ghetto walls, which could be why they survived a few more daytime actions. My mother's brother, Leib Rosenthal, already a well-known published author, poet, and political activist, was helped by his literary friends to get his yellow shame and later the pink shame that would keep his family safe. Leib was assigned to work in a unit whose purpose was gathering of documents, books, works of art, and other important archives from the internationally recognized YIVO, the Vilna-based Jewish Scientific Institute. His job was to make a list in German of the inventory for the Nazi record keepers who planned to transport all archives and artifacts of Jewish historical significance from YIVO back to Germany, where the literature would either be destroyed or kept as relics of an exterminated society. In secret defiance, Leib hid some of the more valuable books and archives, sometimes giving them to select trustworthy poles outside of the ghetto walls for safekeeping. He joined his friends in the paper brigade, all risking their lives, smuggling manuscripts and books within the ghetto, hiding them in canisters down in the sewers, trying to save their treasured literature in whatever manner they could. My uncle Leib, realizing the importance of documenting ghetto life, kept up his literary activity and often wrote articles for the ghetto newspaper called Trep Steps. My father remembered reading one such article that vividly described the terrifying roundup of an action in the ghetto. After some stability began to prevail in the ghetto, Jacob Gens, chief of the ghetto, announced plans for a theater company to be formed inside the ghetto. He believed it would provide relief, hope, and distraction from the fears and the losses everyone was experiencing. That it would also allow actors and writers to be issued work permits, which seemed good for survival. Many intellectuals and rabbis objected strongly to having music in the ghetto, declaring, you don't perform theater in a graveyard. But the shows went on and after a while, they too saw the benefits. Working feverishly by candlelight at night, my uncle Leib wrote songs and short musical reviews for the theater. And in collaboration with the other ghetto writers, he created full length musicals, plays and satires about the ghetto life, about times gone by with songs of hope for the future. 
At times, they would also include in the lyrics of the scripts cryptic messages about plans for the underground resistance movements. Labe's play on words, his witty songs and comedic interchanges made it possible for audiences to see the absurd humor in their own dreadful circumstances. His songs enabled the inmates to laugh at themselves in the midst of their own inescapable suffering, lightening their misery and lifting their spirits. My mother, his little sister Chayala, was a regular feature singing in the jazz ensembles and eventually playing most of the leading roles in Leib's musicals that soon earned her the title Songstress of Hope, Wunderkind Star of the Vilna Ghetto. Nish gedai get svet zayin besser. Don't despair, it will get better, was the motto that came forth. My uncle's songs were sung by the people attending the performances inside the ghetto, as well as by many in the labor units outside the ghetto. Leib's satiric parody, Pesha von Resha, used the main character of a young girl, Pesha, to reflect on the Meshuggahna crazy situation of their lives in the ghetto. His haunting songs, Shortens, Shadows, and Ich Benka Heim, I Long for Home, emoted the sorrows felt by the ghetto inmates in their distraught situation. When my mother sang that last song, Ich Benka Heim, she was told that even the young German soldiers standing at the back of the ghetto theater were seen with tears running down their faces. They could relate to the Yiddish words so similar to German about missing home. My Uncle Leib's song Yisroilik, about a ghetto orphan boy who sings and makes jokes instead of talking about his sorrows, urged people to keep dreaming of a better tomorrow. A time came when Leib had to choose between escaping to the forests with his resistance fighter friends or stay behind in the ghetto to take care of his mother and sisters. Leib remained in the ghetto out of duty to his family and to his commitment to the theater. His partisan friends took with them his stirring songs of resistance as they marched into the woods. His marching song, Zu ein, zwei, drei, ahead, one, two, three, moved them forward with lyrics that promised ultimate victory and vindication. The musical shows provided much needed relief and hope for the rapidly dwindling fear-filled ghetto population. Attending performances in the large auditorium gave them the only opportunity to gather as a community and a chance to learn about what was going on in the ghetto or to be given hints of escape plans and underground activity. Survivors today still talk of the theater as a miracle. Despite the grim reality of the unpredictable actions, the omnipresent random murders, imminent death and starvation, and even the presence of German and Lithuanian soldiers in the audience, none of those would keep them away as it was the only source of some possible joy and hope in the midst of terrifying times. My father never forgot his worst night in the ghetto. It was on Yom Kippur night, just as the evening prayers were about to start, when the wooden gates of the ghetto burst open and in stormed a group of uniformed SS men shouting, Raus! Raus! Zu Arbeit! Out! Out to work! They began rounding up men, women and children from the streets, from the synagogues, from the yards and the cellars. Herding the bewildered people together at gunpoint, they forced them to run towards the street square where another company of German soldiers and Lithuanian police with machine guns aimed were waiting for them. In that evening darkness, the strict blackout regulations were forgotten. For the first time at night, the streets of the ghetto sparkled with flickering lights of many candles, flashlights and blinding automobile lights from the German trucks. The SS men began to remove the sick and the elderly from the hospital, using their rifles and bayonets to beat those who didn't or couldn't move. Everyone in the square was being brutally shoved towards the ghetto gates. If people ran too slowly, the Germans kicked them with their boots. The silence of that Jewish holy night was pierced by screams and wild cries of parents and children searching for each other, 
of Nazi SS men repeatedly barking out their orders, of old men still draped in their prayer shawls, wailing their prayers to the Almighty. As people realized that the Germans had come to take them to their death, they frantically began looking for places to hide. My uncle hid my mother, aunt and grandmother in one of the secret passages prepared in advance that were quickly opened and closed again when filled. My father caught in a group, managed to escape the square by moving quickly into the shadows and running as fast as he could to join his father in the attic of their building, their previously designated hideout space. 15 of them crammed into the smallest space sat in silence without daring to move. Through the thin walls, they heard heavy steps and Germans shouting curses at the two elderly ladies from next door apartment who were too ill to move by themselves. They heard the screams and thumps of the women as they were dragged or thrown down the stairs. Eventually, the mumbled cries and noises outside subsided. And then a neighbor called out from the street in Yiddish, it's over, it's safe to come outside. The Germans have left the ghetto. The next day, the ghetto was a flurry of people going in and out of the buildings, checking to see if loved ones were okay or just looking for loved ones. Too many wandered like lost souls, not knowing what to do for their family members had been snatched up. Children were left without parents parents bereft of their children, a wife without a husband, a brother without a sister, everyone in shock, dazed by the brutality that had brought such devastating loss and mocked their prayers to be inscribed for another year in the book of life. That Yom Kippur night 80 years ago, the Einsatzkommando Aktion took around 5,000 more people from the Vilna ghetto number one. Two more actions followed that same October, one on Simchas Torah and the other days later, getting rid of another 5,000 or so more Jews and also finally liquidating ghetto number two. In the aftermath of the actions, the ghetto's theater group of artists and actors were determined to uplift the spirits again. And so the music productions continued. This cultural and spiritual resistance against the evil of the Nazis showed how, in the face of the most deprived and depraved conditions, people could still rise above their horrific circumstances to create and present art. The shows continued for nearly two more years, right up to the last days when the liquidation of the Vilna ghetto had begun. On September 23rd, 1943, when the ghetto was liquidated, my mother was separated from her beloved brother Leib forever. Leib was sent to the forced labor camp, Camp Kluga in Estonia, where a year later, he was brutally murdered, forced to lie between pyres of wood, shot, and then burned to death just one day before liberation. My mother, her sister, and my grandmother were deported to the labor camp Kaiserwald in Riga. Upon arrival there, selections began. Who looked useful? Who would live? Who was old, sickly, or who should die? My mother stood next to her mother, holding her hand so tightly, the SS man was pointing to the left, to the right, to the left, to the right. He looked at my grandmother and pointed to the left. Quickly, she told my mother to go to the right, to leave her, but my mother would not let go. She was holding her hand so tightly, but her mother pushed her away to the right, to the right, the side of life. That day, I and so many millions more lost our right to ever know and feel the love of a grandmother. My father and my mother were among the mere two or 3,000 Vilna Jews that had survived the actions of the Einsatzkommandos in Vilna. But each still went on to suffer two more years of witnessing and experiencing the unimaginable horrors and torture inflicted upon them and other prisoners in the labor and the concentration camps. Two more years of living with the devastating loss of loved ones 
in constant fear of their own imminent death, always hungry and thirsty, their hands bleeding from hard labor, their thin undernourished bodies shivering in the bitter cold as the winter winds blew through their paper thin cotton shirts in those many hours standing for roll call appel or working all day in the freezing outdoors. Two more years of inhumane treatment, beatings, humiliation, disease and starvation, and of unpredictable long train rides in overcrowded cattle trucks or in the dark, dirty bowels of barges that carried them to the next camp. My mother went to Kaiserwald and Sophienwald, my father to Vivikoni, Putkunda and Burgraben, and then both my parents were sent to Stutthof and both suffered the enforced death march to the Baltic Sea. Liberated from that certain death by the Soviet army, all survivors of the separate women's and men's death marches were taken to Lauenburg. In Lauenburg, my father found and joined a group of old Vilna friends who took him to meet up with some Vilna Landsmädels, girls from home, who apparently were staying in a nearby house. There, my father found the young singer he had written reviews about before the war and whom he remembered from the ghetto performances. He introduced himself for the first time to the now 21-year-old Chayala, whose frail body was now typhoid fever-ridden. With care and patience, he nursed her back to life and into love. My father emerged from the Holocaust determined to share what he witnessed so that those whose lives were lost would be honored and remembered, so the evil atrocities would be known and recorded in the history books, so that lessons of the past might help prevent more evil, so that all future generations could be spared suffering too, so that a Holocaust would never happen again. He published many Holocaust-related articles in the newspapers and was the catalyst for creating the book In Sacred Memory, in which the war stories of many of our Cape Town survivors were published. Forgive, but do not forget, my father always said. And so we, the next and future generations, must continue to tell the stories and to sing their songs. My Uncle Labe's most famous song that is still sung by thousands of different singers around the world speaks of our courage to triumph over evil, to survive no matter what is done to us. His hope and vision for us all to always be able to proudly say, Mir Leben Ebek, Mir Seinen Do, we live forever. We are still here. Mir Leben Ebek. Oh.